So tonight we we're looking at uh, Aaron and I were talking a little bit earlier about mind training teachings, lojum teachings, and they're such a really incredible resource for people in Western countries and full lives that the real opportunities to think practically about how do I transform a very busy active life into a path of awakening. They're just concise, they're pithy, and they're practical. And so this one that I'm highlighting today is actually out of the seven point mind training, the five powers, a synthesis of practice for a single lifetime. And I like this because you don't have to have gone through all the other points to, to utilize it. And I think if we utilize uh, these teachings, we can really just transform our everyday experience and keep us with a trajectory of cultivating our spiritual path. We did a full retreat up at Juanita on these months. And they're handy. It's, you know, we have this opportunity each day that will never come again. And sometimes you know, we can do this nice meditation in the morning, think about that, and then go out the door. Then my worldly life shows up. <laughs> and then, you know, uh, I might say some prayers before I go to bed. And then, you know, the next day, a nice little practice. And then my worldly life shows up. And it's, you know, the sort of equivalent of collecting you know little raindrops in a bowl my little merit and wisdom and then i walk out and i float you know and then i come back and try to collect and we can make our everyday interactions be this path and uh, and so these five i think are just really solid really solid way of reminding ourselves of this gift and utilize it to recognize that every day I'm cultivating a path of awakening every single day. And so the first one's very uh, straightforward, a resolve. It, uh, the power of resolve, that I am going to resolve to never be parted from my path. I'm going to resolve to not forget why I'm here. I had the honor of being at a retreat over the New Year's eight days there's two different retreats total of eight days but what really hit me personally was remembering who i am you know like people unplugged to remember who they are and uh because we can forget all that we can have done a lot of really good work in our lifetime we can have done a lot of things that are meaningful and learn a lot of lessons and then then the next week and the next thing comes on and then we get busy and then our habits come back in and then, you know, take a retreat and we make space to go, okay, why am I here? You know, why am I here? Get back in touch with what my body feels like and what my mind, you know, settles. And, and I start tapping back into reality a little bit. And, um, there were some people that had never really been on retreat and you know it wasn't even about remembering who they were in a sense it was discovering you know for a bit of what it's like to not be uh distracted in uh, our eight worldly concerns and so retreats are great for that we pause we, we we step out of that stream of busyness that mind stream of activity and we can unplug and then you know start to notice feet on the ground again when you walk you know have a cup of tea if you want a cup of tea and just have a cup of tea and it's in that spaciousness that we can start to tap into you know, why we're here what is this experience i'm having and then i can start to pay attention to that and we can do a similar thing every day if we make time for it, if we make time to reestablish our resolve, to remember, you know, what's my journey about? What's my, what is this rare and precious gift that is today? It helps if I understand its value. 
otherwise, you know, we could say, yeah, you know, this day will never come again and have these great teachings, but that can be an intellectual endeavor. But what if I viscerally knew and had some idea of all the causes and conditions that's gone through lifetimes for me to be here now? In this moment and the seeds of the path of awakening ripening here and the opportunity so close to just wake up what if i knew that you know that's a different experience and and sometimes these things seem so far away and they seem for other people we say things like well in a few lifetimes but we don't know how close we are and yeah we just don't know how close we are and it can slip away if i'm not really cultivating that resolve to fully engage in this life in a way that is allowing a path of freedom for myself and all sentient beings so this resolve is built upon a sense of realization not just an intellectual understanding and so we have the four thoughts that turn the mind to dharma and those are good good foundation but this resolve uh, is even a, a notch above that so it's an understanding that right now i have full access to bodhicitta i have full access to a bodhisattva path uh, out of how many other beings you know, do, do they have this? And it's taken eons of lifetimes to get here. And it's just right here. And, uh, and we can toss it away in an instant to go feel good about something. So without this resolve, we could easily uh, shift into complacency and this big tragedy happens. Big tragedy. When life's difficult and things are hard, the seats are all full. People seek answers, people come to Dharma talks, people go to their other spiritual traditions, they go to their psychologists, they work really hard. And then life's not so hard anymore. And ah, samsara, which I was seeking to get rid of, uh, I start decorating and uh, thinking about how to decorate my, my samsara. And, and uh, you know, when things are going well, it's hard to grow well. And we can only coast downhill. And so there's this nature of, uh, well, I've done this work, things have gotten better. And then I stop doing some of that work and the samsara comes back in, habits, re-entrench and then you know skipping a meditation skipping a prayer skipping this then um and we can lose this very precious gift so that's why you know in order to have this type of result it's very good to have spiritual friends it's very good to surround ourselves with like-minded people to uh, have practices that we can come together uh, because we can easily uh, drift off. It's hard to be that fish going upstream all by yourself. I was in this room, and yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in this room. And somebody had told me about this really nice guy. That, man, I think he's a builder, a carpenter, and he's, he was a former Tibetan monk. You know, like, oh, you're a former Tibetan monk. Yeah, yeah, so many years of monk. They said, well, you know, do you, uh, you should come to our center. And, you know, yeah. And he goes, ah, I'm too busy. You know, too busy. I got too much work. And, and that's where my, my big line is. I, I'm too busy decorating some sorry to make time to eliminate it. 
I'm too busy creating this. And I thought, well, that's pretty sad. And uh, so the sense of resolve you know, needs to have some clarity to it that says, you know, to recognize the, wow, how close we are. And we don't know how close we are. We can, if we think about it, see how few people make it to a Dharma center, how few people have access to teachings and, and a path, and how few um, engage in that. It's pretty rare. But in our own path, I mean, you know, my story was very simple. And, uh, you know, I went to a Dharma teaching by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And, you know, I thought, when will I ever see him? Ever in my life. And what a gift it was. And it was a cool thing. And, um, but I was just a guy, you know. Two years later, I'm a Buddhist monk and I'm greeting His Holiness, hosting him for three days of teaching. You know, how's that happen? We don't know how close we are to certain things. And then teachers that I've, I've had opportunities. And so even though our life can seem pretty mundane and other things seem so far away, often they're not that far. We're just pointing in the wrong direction. Our attention is directed in the wrong place. And we spend a little too much time decorating samsara, not enough time, piercing the veil of samsara. So this resolve is really, you know, really important. And the resolve on a technical level in the seven point mind train is a resolve to never be parted from ultimate and uh, relative bodhicitta, that aspiration to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings that we've found this bodhisattva path and, and a resolve to stick to it, to not forget about it, to engage with this path and in order to have that resolve well you need to have some faith in that path and that faith can't be uh, arbitrary it can't be I read it in a book it can't be so and so told me or that teacher's charismatic or any of those types of things it's not a very solid foundation for faith uh, faith built upon experience, faith built upon a direct uh, analytical piercing nature of, of the teachings of the path that we've checked it out. It makes sense. It, it holds up to scrutiny. Uh, I've seen people on the path that, that have certain qualities. Their ethics are impeccable. They have some inner peace. They don't get rattled that much. And they have some stability. Uh, that there's a teaching and a lineage and, and people who have walked this path before and that there's a very clear guidance available to us. It's that kind of faith, that faith that uh, arises from uh, looking thoroughly and asking questions, asking lots of questions and investigating, being a first person investigator. If we do such things, and then we become convinced this is a good path for us, this bodhisattva path, and, and then can really grasp on to what a treasure it is. Well, then we can remind ourselves every day that uh, I'm committed. I'm in this for the long haul. But if I forget to remind myself, I may forget. So this, this resolve you know, that we can, can declare every day. Uh, I know, Aaron, you posted a little Dalai Lama about how they're going to use this day. And I'm not going to waste this day. I'm going to use it to cultivate myself, to be a benefit to all sentient beings. You know, Dalai Lama's beautiful morning inspiration. And so we could take some time to reflect upon that. And even though we may not be in a place, there's the ultimate versions of all these things. Um, maybe our resolve is not that I fully understand the path or I'm fully committed, but may I have a resolve to not suffer and to, you know, really give this a shot and have a resolve to investigate 
this opportunity. We can make that resolve. But the resolve is something that we really want to cultivate. And it's not something like I, I took it, I made it, and I'm going to maintain it. The resolve can be I took it, I meant it, and now it's Tuesday and I forgot all about it. <laughs> and then I take it again and I make it and then I'm going to do it and, and then I'll drift off. But I keep having the resolve that when I notice that I'm going to come back. Because these things are not 180 degree, I did this and it's changing. It's, it's much more of I'm on a trajectory. I have all of this tendency and karma and klesha. And I've been moving this big ship like a Titanic and I'm shifting it slowly and methodically. And over the course of time, it really directs. And after a while, it starts, you know, flowing in the direction and, and thoughts more naturally come that are in accordance much more so with reality and my perception and my understanding of the source of suffering and the source of happiness become much more a direct experience over time. Then it's much more, you know, we caught now with biology and, and the, just what we know about uh, human biology, neural pathways get redirected we rewire ourselves and our DNA expression can change. And, and that's what we're doing. We can do it consciously. But if I'm not driving it consciously, it's unconscious and the habits just go on and on. And, and they're strong. They're very strong. So I resolve to not miss this opportunity. The second one is familiarity. So if I were to apply this power of resolve, here's a day that is not going to come again. And I am resolving to, to really maintain a practice to remember why I'm here. Why am I here? You know, and, and is it to get a good 401k? Or is it to transcend the nature of suffering? Is it to be a benefit to all sentient beings? Is it to seek and find a spiritual path that works for me. What, why is it I'm here? Being clear about that. It's really hard to make healthy decisions if I don't know why I'm here. It's really hard to make healthy decisions. If I don't know my purpose. It's really challenging. So understanding that, having clarity around that is all the difference. And the clarity doesn't have to be, I know the whole end game. The clarity can be uh, that I am seeking a path that can lead me to no more suffering. So I'm still just in an investigation. And there's many paths for that. We don't have the the corner marketed. Or the, yeah, is that right? Market. Mark, market cornered. We don't have the market corner, not the corner marketed. We could market the corner. <laughs> market the corner yes. it's sell it to a lot of people. <laughs> but it's the other way around. And so finding that spiritual community, finding that path, finding, you know, that, that path that, that, you know, is speaking to your mind stream in a way that's going to alleviate itself. That's really what we're talking about. And then reminding yourself of that value. And once I'm there, then I need to become familiar with that path. I need to become familiar with the teachings, the the uh, familiarity of a practice meditation you know the tibetan word gum gum gap to meditate gap so the action part of that means to become familiar with to become familiar with uh bhavanas cultivate in a different language we cultivate some but this is to become familiar with and so people have found that sitting down to meditate can be a pretty challenging thing. <laughs> and, and it's very unfamiliar. It's very unfamiliar to sit and not do, you know, a lot of activity to sit and to focus on one thing or to bring one thing to mind or whatever a meditation is very unfamiliar. And our minds are habituated to 
seeking things or reacting to things and familiarity then with our mind and with the nature of things and familiarity with a practice and with meditation to become familiar with that practice, to become familiar with a posture, to become familiar with my awareness and what I'm attending to. And, and that type of familiarity is only going to happen with repetition. And that repetition is going to happen with resolve. Because uh, otherwise I can sleep in. I also you know, get 4.30, come on, go sleep in. We get some breakfast later. Get up and do a practice. Become familiar with something. Find a time that works. And then do it again and again and again. The, the way we develop skill is through practice. The way we become familiar with something is we look deeply at it. And we return to it. We get to know it. We experience it. So to become familiar with. And here, this implication within the mind training is to become familiar with uh, this interdependent nature of our experience. You know, starting to understand it's in interdependent nature that the things that I'm seeing appear deceptively and become familiar with how they appear to me deceptively. You know, as the, the labels that I apply to people they seem really true, so that's who they are. As opposed to a human being who's just showing up in a particular way, depending upon how I'm showing up and, and all the totality of that experience in that moment. And then there's a new moment. So to become familiar with that, to see it, explore it, become familiar with how things appear deceptively take some some real practice so the entry point is well let's say i start some resolve i want to resolve to live a meaningful life it's a good point i want to resolve to be a more ethical valuable life i want to resolve to engage in a path in, of, of my lifetime that's meaningful very good well now i need to become familiar with those uh, tools and skills that enable that process. Whether meditation, prayer, the way I interact with others. I want to become familiar with my ethics. Ethics are the foundation of all spiritual growth and source of all well-being, wholesome activities. Well, I want to become familiar with those. And we'll become familiar with them by bringing them to mind again and again. So in our morning practice, the little booklet that we have, you know, there's a nice little reflection on where the 10 wholesome actions, where the 10 unwholesome actions. You can become familiar with that. Sometimes things seem like, oh, there's so much. So we start with becoming familiar maybe with a routine, familiar with the routine of you know, getting up at a particular time. It's interesting, that, you know, uh, how that can change. I'm not a morning person, except that's not very true anymore. So I get up in the morning pretty early. So am I a morning person or not? That's this label I stick with myself. But over the years, uh, I get up and, and having a commitment to get up and then doing it at the same time. Well, uh, initially it can be kind of, do it for a little while and then, you know, mine just says, ah, I can sleep in a day or something else is more interesting. And we can go back into the old habits. But if we become familiar with, well, I'm gonna do it anyway, I have a resolve, I set that resolve before I go to bed. You know, when I wake up, uh, I've got my, my routine ready. Don't wanna forget this opportunity. Uh, I actually I make a coffee, pot all set up and then I set the timer and it's all ready and I have my space available. Become familiar with and by doing this again and again then we have an opportunity to uh, cultivate, rewire ourselves uh, to have some stability and then be able to bring those qualities now into my experience and become more familiar with my experience of how I interact with others, what's healthy and what's not healthy. 
what's meaningful and what's not. So we're, we're in this boot camp in a sense, you know, it's, uh, it's something that takes some training. It takes some dedication. It takes some repetition to develop the, the ability to not be a prisoner of my own mind, to be a prisoner of my feelings, to be a prisoner of samsara. And so these first two, I think, are just, you know, I love the way it lays it out, a resolve and then, you know, really familiarize myself with the habits that are healthy and routines. And, and then I can bring a freshness to my experience and see the world quite a bit differently with a little more accuracy than just my obsessive, compulsive, busy mind that's reacting to everything. I need to really be fine-tuned there. I'm going to pause there for just a moment because I am aware there's so many people online in case anyone has a question. Uh, just pause there for a moment. Can you see if people have questions from where you're reading? I can only see it, I think, if they include me in okay. their response, which okay. is not necessary. Okay. All right. So, so far, so good. The third one is, uh, and I love the way it can be phrased, uh, the power of this white seed, you know, this white seed. If we think of the seed of uh, awakening, this beautiful white seed of, of awakening of the path that, that I have. I have it, it's here. And we do have it, we all have it. And those of us uh, who have the rare and precious human birth that we currently have, you know, we have this beautiful white seed and, and that we are going to do everything in our power, not every single day to not waste the opportunity to nurture and grow that seed of awakening. And so we're going to use every bit of fertilizer we can get. Every bit of fertilizer. And that fertilizer often looks like shit. It's uh, not pleasant. Doesn't smell good. Doesn't feel good. Difficult times. Transforming adversity in the path. It's, I am going to use the difficult times that I encounter to nurture and cultivate this merit and this wisdom and this path of awakening. And so I'm going to transform these events that often seem very difficult and give rise to anger, fear, insecurity, disappointment, to recognize that all of that, that's the fertilizer for the growth. That is where I get to fully engage in the path. The old saying, no mud, no lotus, you know, mud is from which the lotus, that uh, symbolic awakening as it transcends through the water and then the lotus opens, but it takes the mud, it takes the difficulties and without these challenges, I wouldn't have the opportunity to cultivate this path of awakening. So this power, this white seed to, to really take some time to reflect upon how aware I am of it. And by aware of it, I mean that there are so many, even, you know, humans that don't have a rare and precious human rebirth. They're not even aware or have an inkling just yet of their spiritual potential. <clears throat> there are so many that don't even have the opportunity to practice. There's so many who are just trying to survive. And, and out of all these lives, you know, We've met with all the 18 conditions we have this and it's this treasure and we're just sitting on it all the time the thing is we want to take care of it we want to utilize it we don't want to waste this this opportunity to flourish and nurture and grow and see clearly be free of suffering so this power this way it's is to really reflect and make a commitment to not get caught up in adversity to understand that the challenges I'm facing are really the opportunities to grow they are 
the sandpaper that smooths my edges, refines me, takes care of me, the fertilizer of the sea, you know, all those metaphors. And as I said earlier, when things are going well, we're rarely growing well. It takes adversity to really dig in and, and ponder, and that's at times of our greatest growth. So recognizing that every single event in my life today is an opportunity to cultivate the path of awakening. That's a different mind. You know, here's a day that will never come again, whatever's happening giving me an opportunity to develop merit and wisdom, and that is the path of awakening. So I can develop more merit by how I engage in this path selflessly, helpfully, with wholesome activities, virtue, with a, with a motivation to use this interaction in a way to help others. Merit, wisdom, to not be a prisoner of the self-cherishing attitude of the anger, the resentment, the disappointment that arises to, to really start to experience it as disappointment and the nature of that instead of I'm disappointed. Understanding that I'm not the center of the universe. That this whole world wasn't created to make John happy. And to stop trying to arrange it so it can and start understanding I'm a part of something. There's an interdependent experience. It's that wisdom that we cultivate to see how things are as accurately as we can that eliminates those misperceptions. So this white seed is that opportunity to remember that right now, my path of awakening is right here. And I have everything I need to engage with it. And that's what I'm gonna to do today. Fourth. I'm just gonna pause there again, just in case. This fourth's gonna take a little while. So uh, but we're seeing if anyone has a question or a thought. Oh, we got a hand. All right. So I believe that's uh, here now, Center. And hey, John. It's Matt here in Goddess. Hey, Matt. Um, hey. You know, uh, my question is if uh, resolve, if we measure it on a scale of one to 10. Um, with 10 being maximal resolve, is a 10 what, I guess, a 10 an ideal condition for the kind of, the kind of awakening uh, we're going for um, I, or, or not? Because in my own experience, I've found some value in letting off the gas pedal a little bit and doubting things and, quit and maybe not having the strongest resolve. Um, I found value in that. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if you see the same thing or not. Yeah. Thanks, man. That's an excellent question. And for those of you who may not have been able to hear it fully, the other people in mind, <clears throat> this idea of resolve, you know, is it something that I'm full bore of 110% he used a scale of one to 10 and resolve being maximum. Uh, and whereas I think what Matt's sharing is that uh, we don't want to confuse that with forcing, being too tight, uh, pushing myself too much, being self-critical, you know, driving myself too much. Uh, that, you know, in, in the words Matt used, you know, sometimes there's value in stepping back. And so it's exactly that. We always need to start where we are. And if we push too hard, we can be brittle or bitter and, and hard and, and but with resolve if we take it in its context of uh, if this teaching specifically the resolve is to never let go of a commitment to cultivate your highest potentials so in that sense that doesn't have to be uh, full bore or not full bore it's, it's a firm resolve 
And it's something that I make every day that it's a remembering and a commitment to. And in that resolve of always cultivating this path of awakening, not giving up on it, I will not be very good at it if I'm self-critical. I will not be very good at it if I'm down on myself. I will not be able to help anyone if I don't accept my own limitations and if I don't cultivate a healthy sense of self to move along the path. So it's not to be confused with often um, a full force, overzealous uh, extreme that people can get into. I'm going to meditate 10 hours a day or I'm going to you know, do so many of this a day and I'm going to, you know, an, a very unrealistic push, uh, which makes the mind you know, brittle and bitter and, and we burn out and we don't cultivate, you know, you can, uh, you can be pretty spiritual sitting in a, in the hot spring sometimes, you know, because that's what the body needs and why are you there? So the resolve um, in this sense isn't about uh, that push in that sense. It's about constantly growing as I cultivate my path, that commitment to the path. And part of that commitment to the path is a middle way and a balanced view in my activities. And the ability to uh, really take good care of myself so I can uh, go the distance. So that kind of a resolve. And that's a really good point you make because people do make this gung-ho, uh, going to strive it. Uh, one of our teachers, Alan Wallace, talks about that. You know, going up in the mountains, going to just nail shamatha, going to nail that meditation, you know, nearly die, you know, just forcing it. And that's not very helpful. So hopefully I spoke to that question. Yeah, thank you, John. Thank you. It's a really good point because these things can get confusing in that way pretty easily. Okay. Any other questions? We are nearing our time here. We've got a few minutes. So I don't want to tap into the, the, the next one is really this uh, abandoning, this self grasping that creates so much problem. <laughs> Yes. It's kind of a, a thought as I'm hearing it, what you're speaking about that in that question is that we, we're taking on, in a way, a mental stance, a mindset about this resolve to never let go, never stop the path of relative enlightenment, bodhicitta. However, within that, we have to learn the skillful methods to be able to guide ourselves and our own practice to not be too tight too loose so we might go through these different phases of i've noticed in my own practice loose, loosening up too much and then tightening up too much but trying to be skillful about how to reorient ac actions around a resolve that never changes you know a resolve that's always deeply rooted mm -hmm. does that sound similar yeah and uh, i'm not sure if anyone heard that online but uh Aaron, really making that point in a way that we can have a very a mental stance of resolve of uh, not giving up this path of a bodhisattva, being uh, committed to it, but learning the skillful methods, you know, sometimes loosening up too much and getting not very, uh, you know, loosening up too much and not really being able to engage in healthy ways and tightening up too much pushing. And that we're learning the skillful means to be able to engage with this path, uh, but we can be developing and holding uh, the resolve and growing the resolve. Because all of this is, um, is something that's, that develops and, um, and it's not like I make a resolve and I hold it. it. It's much more that some days I'm gonna have some resolve, some days I'm not. And then some days, uh, oh yeah, and then some days, you know, I drift way off. But the idea is that I am developing and bringing to mind as I investigate this path, a deeper understanding and commitment to that path. So that resolve 
the stability of that resolve will be quite uh, quite ingrained and it's a mental stance not one where uh, I'm not able to joke or have fun or uh, be present with someone but that moment to moment you know I'm developing something I'm nurturing something and then it just becomes more stable it becomes like oh yeah why would I want anything else and and that mental state just becomes, I am really clear this is the path. And, and then in order to develop that is I need to remind myself why. Why would I have this resolve? And so there's a nice reflection that we can do in the morning to reflect upon how much I've developed in my life as a result of engaging in the path. So we're developing that resolve by bringing to mind uh, the many benefits of this rare and precious opportunity and not taking it for granted. And that's the danger is letting that slip. Is, uh, but it doesn't mean you don't get a day off. But it means monitor what's healthy and what's not. And we'll get more skillful as we go on. And uh, I was just listening to Jetsuma Tenzin Palma just a little bit before coming here. And um, you know, she, again, she's just so skillful. And, and this is someone who has some resolve, you know, 12 years in a cave, you know, sitting in a meditation box, not laying down to sleep. <laughs> you know, she's got some resolve. And she just makes this point that Buddha is very skillful about um, our uh, teaching people to have a really healthy sense of self, to take care of themselves, to sustain themselves in real nurturing, balanced ways. And and then as we heal and become more whole and well, then we're able to go more deeply into this path. And, um, and then, you know, we need to do it in, in, in that way. The middle path, very, very thoughtful. And so we do need to, you know, if I, beating myself up is, is never going to help me uh, engage in a path of awakening. That's just more self-grasping. So really being gentle with ourselves and knowing that we're, we're turning a big ship <laughs> and, and we just want to keep doing that more skillfully over time. You know, that's the practice. Still a lump of clay, working on it. Let's take a moment to be in this moment to reflect upon the merit and the wisdom we have accumulated here today and throughout our lifetimes. And let us dedicate this merit and wisdom for the benefit of all sentient beings. May all sentient beings be free of suffering. Find their true awakening. May we be able to use the merit and wisdom accumulate here today and through our lifetimes to purify our own minds, to help us engage in this path that helps us recognize our own Buddha nature that we can truly be a benefit to all sentient beings. And let us also dedicate the merit and wisdom accumulated here today and throughout our lifetimes for the long life of all spiritual teachers of all spiritual traditions, authentically teaching a path of no more suffering. May they live long, may their teachings flourish, may their students find their path. <laughs>